our efforts to make change, even when our heart is in the right place, are still at high risk for reproducing patterns of racism and marginalization. That's what I want to spend my time on with you today. So I'm going to tell a story that to some of you has become a familiar one, but I hope that even in the retelling of it, you'll hear something new or find something new that you can relate to. And for those of you for whom it's new, I hope you find it to make my point clearly. In order to make the point that's on the slide right now, I'm going to tell you a story about a group of children in a, who are rising fifth graders. The problem that these children are working on, the math problem, is this one. They're trying to identify what number on that number line is the orange arrow pointing to. And just briefly, I think most people in the room will recognize that, first of all, that idea of looking at fractions as numbers on the line is something that came to us over the last several years to school curriculum through the Common Core. As I became an elementary school teacher and taught math, I can tell you that in the 1980s and 90s, we weren't focusing on so much on fractions as points on the line in elementary school. And this is actually not an easy idea. As we taught fractions, we tended to emphasize area models and parts of sets. But ultimately, children have to understand that the number line is populated infinitely densely with more and more numbers that they'll encounter as they grow older, and this is not easy. And for these children, this is right at the beginning of their encountering that not only do fractions refer to parts of pizzas and cookies, but are also numbers that live among the whole numbers. So this problem is not easy for them. And in fact, in the class that we're going to be watching, which comprises 30 children, 22 of them black children, four of them Latinx children, and four of them white. This is a brand new idea, and at the point we'll begin watching video, 26 of them have an answer other than one third, which is, you undoubtedly can see, should ultimately be the answer. So they have other answers. So turn and talk for just a moment. You may be by someone who doesn't teach elementary school math or isn't familiar with that, and just share a couple of projections of what you think children for whom this is new might think the orange arrow is pointing to. Just exchange a few ideas before I show you the video. All right, let's come back together. <laughs> so undoubtedly, among you, you were able to pool pr predictions like one-fourth or two-fourths. You might not have predicted negative one. You might have predicted one. Uh, there are undoubtedly other numbers that you can guess. So we're going to now like, watch a little bit. And remember that my claim is that even when we turn to better curriculum, more ambitious academic standards, more rigor, classrooms that are cla places in which children are respected and discussion happens, we're still at incredibly high risk for the perpetuation of racism and marginalization as it seeps into our classrooms. That's my point, so watch as we dig into this. So the two protagonists on whom we'll focus initially are these two black girls, Anaya on the left and Tony on the right. Although they're both black girls, they, you know, they're very different from one another. They have different statuses in the classroom. They perform their black girlness in different ways. Uh, they don't necessarily, aren't hanging out together, but they are in the classroom together, working together on math. And I'm gonna first show you um, the very beginning of the class discussion in which children begin to talk about the problem I showed you. Remember that I told you that 26 of the children have answers other than one third. And just before the seg when I start showing you the video, the bid that the teacher has made goes like this. So everyone has worked on the problem a little bit. They've talked to their neighbor. And the teacher says, would someone be willing to come up to the board and show us what you came up with? Your answer doesn't have to be right because this is something new that we're working on. But who'd be willing to come up and show us your, what you did and what you're thinking? So just remember that. And now we're going to begin. Anaya is the girl who goes to share her answer. Listen closely and see what you think about her reasoning and her answer. Um, I put one seventh because there's. Did she say one seventh? Yeah. Shh. Because there's um seven equal parts, like one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Before you agree or disagree, I want you to ask questions if there's something you don't understand about what she did. No agreeing and disagreeing, just all you can do right now is ask Anaya questions. Who has a question for her? Okay, Tony, what's your question for her? <laughs> what did 
Go ahead. It's your turn. Why did you pick one seven? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now I want you to take a moment and think about what are likely common responses to Anaya? And then in a moment, I'll ask you what are likely common responses to Tony. So when I ask you that question, I'm not asking you what should happen, what would you do. I'm asking you to call upon your knowledge of the common and normalized ways that schooling works, that the culture of teaching has taught us all a certain set of habits of response, and think to yourself, what is it you think is likely to be said next to Anaya? Just think for a moment, don't even turn and talk. Just try to imagine, if you're a coach, what have you seen teachers say? If you're a teacher, what is something that you know that other teachers might say? If you're a school leader, what have you seen in observations? What do you think might get said to Anaya? Anaya is the one who said, it's one seventh, and explain it. Okay, so now I'm gonna share a few with you that I hear repeatedly as I ask people what they think will be said. So one is, Nice job, Anaya. Can someone help Anaya out and show what the hole is on the number line? And I'm just gonna show you a couple right now. We'll do more of this. A second one is thumbs up if you agree with Anaya, thumbs down if you disagree. Two extremely common responses. On the face of them, they don't look evil, right? That's what I mean. They look like actually good practice. So what's the impact of these two very common responses? Well, in both cases, in different ways, first of all, Anaya is positioned as not smart. If you need to help Anaya out, suggest that what she's just done needs help, not that it's something that's contributing to our collective work. Her mathematical points are sidelined, and I'm gonna to return to that in a moment, but while you're thinking about my claim about that, try to think what are the contributions that Anaya's solution makes to the class's work. Think about her explanation. You're gonna hear it again in a moment. What is it that she's contributing that by saying who can help her out, we're no longer using? And it's not just about Anaya, because by saying either of these things, the mathematical work of the class isn't supported. That is, by not using what Anaya has done, it interferes with the progress of the class. And finally, and very explicitly, everyone else in the class, not just Anaya, sees a black girl who's being positioned as a struggling learner. So there are consequences not only for Anaya's identity, but for what everyone in the class is learning about black girls. So let's move on to Tony and do the same thing again. What are likely common responses to Tony? Take a moment and think. Tony is the one who first says, did she say one seventh? And then when asked who would like to ask a question says, why did you pick one seventh? So think for a moment, what do you think is likely to be said to Tony? Okay, so one possible and very common response would be, Tony, when you're ready to participate appropriately by not playing with your hair and not laughing, then, and have a real question to ask, then I'll come back to you. Is this something you can imagine being said to Tony? Okay. Or, you need to be a better listener, Tony. Anaya just explained why she came up with one seventh. Who else, who else has an actual question for Anaya? Or maybe a direct rebuke, Tony, we show others respect in this classroom. So what's the impact of those three rather common responses to Tony? Well, first of all, Tony's positioned as not paying attention and off task. Her, also, her mathematical contributions are excluded, so just take a moment and think, what, is, what are Tony's mathematical contributions? And what happens by sidelining them? What is it that she's contributing? The mathematical work of the class is slowed by taking time away from what's actually going on to make comments about her behavior or her listening. And finally, sort of parallel to Anaya, the class sees a black girl positioned as a troublemaker and not contributing. So there's a lesson being taught here about black girls in both cases. So why does this happen? Why is it that these kinds of things happen all the time in our classrooms? I'm sure I don't have to connect the dots to show you why behaviors of that type and responses of that type are what I mean by contributing to the perpetual 
perpetuation of marginalization and oppression. I'm gonna step back out for a moment to the more macro perspective on schooling historically and politically. And to do that, I'm gonna use this diagram. And the purpose of the diagram is to remind all of us that while what goes on inside of classrooms among students, for example, the way Tony and I are talking to one another uh, as teachers interpret their students, so the teacher is deciding what she makes of what Tony is saying. Tony and Anaya and the other kids are all trying to interpret what the teacher is doing. They're working on something, in this case it's fractions, but it could just as well be a, con a conflict that occurred on the playground or something that's happening in the community. They're interacting about something. And all of that's really complicated. Teachers have to figure out what their kids know and what they bring. Kids are trying to figure out what their teachers are saying to them. Kids are responding to what they think about what their teachers or how their teachers are positioning them. There's all the stuff about what the kids already know that teachers do or don't have access to. So all of that inside the classroom is really complicated. And we all know that. We all do that. We help people do that. But more than that, the diagram is intended to show us that none of that's happening in a vacuum. All of that is happening sitting in a large kind of soup of our histories, our culture, our society. So out in that thing I'm calling the environments are lots of things. They are the values and knowledge of communities. They are the kinds of language, resources, and tools that different communities have. So they're things in the environment that are really important for schooling. They're also things that are about our history, for example, the legacy of oppression and punishment of blacks, the history of the scientific racism of measurement, policies that infringe on teachers' capacity to respond to their students, parents' arguments about the curriculum, policymakers' efforts to either infringe upon or somehow support education. All of that is in the environments, and I'm not making any attempt to sort it out except to signal to all of us that classroom teaching is all situated in a broader set of historical and contemporary patterns. Now, the point here is complicated because we could have a long conversation about how this is a big problem for us as educators. There are all these things going on in the environment that we need to stay out of our way so we can serve our students. And many teachers feel very put upon about the degree to which the outside environments, especially policies, are interfering with their work. And they feel that teaching is incredibly constrained and they yearn for a day that they may remember or wish for in which the creativity that led them to teaching would be possible. They see this as infringing on it. Fair enough. Or people who are really, really, really eager to teach in ways that are culturally responsive also find these kinds of constraints really troubling because they want the environments to come inside of classrooms. They want to be able to use the resources of the community. That's what they construe to be good education. And we all, we talk about this, this is important. So when the classroom is buffered with these kind of strong boundaries, it makes it very difficult to be culturally responsive. So there's a lot to say about the creeping in from the environment of patterns of racism, of marginalization, of the way that black girls are read. All of that is because people grow up with those images that they carry with them. But at the same time, we also want to be able to use the environment. So what that leaves us with is kind of a, a truth that we can't escape, which is on one hand, and this is a big point I want to leave you with today. On one hand, teaching and learning are incredibly constrained by policies and by histories and by things that we don't control. However, teaching is also incredibly discretionary work, incredibly individualistic, incredibly idiosyncratic. More than probably most professions, teachers have incredible discretion over their work. And that's where we're gonna to focus today is on the power of that discretion and the dangers and risks of that discretion. So when you look at this diagram, I want you to focus on the fact that that permeable boundary around the classroom means that the history of our country and the ways in which black children, that brown children, immigrant children, non-English dominant children, and I could go on with social groups, have been positioned all creeps in, in the biases and ideas that we have, in the way our curriculum are constructed, in the policies we have, and the discretion, it's in the bodies and minds of us as teachers who grow up here, who are trained here, or who come here later in life and absorb this, it's all going on, it's all seeping in, and it's in that discretion that we have the power to either interrupt or perpetuate those patterns. I'm gonna shrink the diagram way down. And for this talk this morning, I'm gonna concentrate on the dynamics between teachers and kids when I think about this discretion. But I could give another whole talk in which I concentrate on the discretion teachers have over the curriculum, 
which might make that red circle move kind of over to include the stuff more. So as we make decisions about what to teach, what text to read, what problems to use, we're also exercising much more discretion than we sometimes acknowledge. But I'm gonna focus on the dynamics between teachers and students the most, with acknowledging that bearing that has on the content. So just to explain what I mean, this is a diagram of about a minute 28 seconds of classroom interaction. You don't have to read, and in fact, it's pretty much a transcript of what I already showed you. Um, but you can see there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of body movement, there's a lot going on. And I can pick any of these lines in here to show you the discretion that the teacher has. So I reported to you that the teacher said this at the beginning of launching the discussion. You didn't see that, but I told you about it. Now think about that for a minute. A discussion has to be launched somehow. No policymaker is ever going to tell a teacher what words to use to launch a discussion. That is a discretionary act, and there is a big difference between that exercise of discretion and you could think of 50 other ways to launch a discussion, but let's suppose the one that goes like, who has the right answer and will tell us what it is? That's a completely different launch to a discussion. Or turn and talk to your neighbor and tell your neighbor what you came up with is another launch to a discussion and they have different consequences. So that's an example of a discretionary space that gets filled not by policy, not by the textbook, but by the discretion that teachers exercise. Something rather different is you may have noticed that there were children kind of like lying like that. So this teacher doesn't say anything about that, but you can, I'm sure, been in classrooms where someone would say, okay, we're just gonna pause for a moment until everyone sits up, feet on the floor, look where should be looking, is a different exercise of discretion. And again, no policy is gonna control that, that exact move at that moment. A teacher might say, Dante, we're not gonna move on until you're sitting appropriately. It might be calling out an individual student. In this case, the teacher does nothing, which is also a move. To do nothing is also a move, but it's an act of discretion. And Dante says something to Tony at the end. Again, the teacher might respond or not respond. We get to pull every line out of here and I would illustrate for you that these are each discretionary spaces that teachers act in. And that means that the basic point is teaching is just dense with these discretionary spaces. Dense with them, and it's through those spaces that we have the power to either disrupt or reproduce racism and marginalization. So let's just think about a few seconds of the video I showed you, zooming right in on what we really looked at with the one third on the number line. So here's the transcript again, there's Tony. Um, Tony at one point says, during Anaya's explanation, did she say one seventh? That's a discretionary space. A teacher might decide to do something about the fact that she's speaking while another girl is speaking. In this case, nothing happened. Uh, Tony starts to ask a question and then laughs at another student. In this case, the teacher said, go ahead, Tony, it's your, it's your turn. But the teacher might have said any number of other things at that moment. And then Tony asks her question, why did you pick one seventh, which written in text, we know it sounds a little bit different than that. So how Tony asked it as well as that she asked it is another discretionary space. What I mean by discretionary space is something happens that, uh, to which a teacher is either gonna respond or not, and teaching is replete with those spaces. So this has consequences for Anaya and for Tony, and also for their classmates. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you the two discretion, really zoom in. Sorry. I put... I'm gonna zoom in on why did you pick one seventh and just think about that space. I put one seventh because there's... Did she pick one seventh? Yeah. Why did you pick one seventh? Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so that's fresh in your mind now? All right, so now I'm gonna go back out again. So I'm trying to connect larger patterns of our history and our society to the moment-to-moment -moment work we do to show that this is exactly how it's possible for racism to be reproduced even when we're teaching common core content and we have a classroom in which there's discussion. So let's look at the micro of that tiny bit of video through the macro lens. And the macro lens I'm gonna choose here is black girls' rates of suspension in school. So this is one graphic that displays something with which I'm sure you're familiar, which is the disproportionate uh, dis discipline of black girls in schooling. So the diagram is kind of interesting the way it's put. 
What you can see here is that black girls represent one in six of the girls in school, whereas white girls represent half of the girls in school. But the bars go exactly the opposite of the proportionality. So black girls, while they're one in six, count for over one third of the in-school suspensions. And white girls and black girls are similar, although there are many more white girls than black girls. But by the time you get to multiple suspensions, black girls, who are relatively few, account for over half the multiple suspensions, whereas white girls account for only one-fifth of them. And that's what we mean by disproportionate rates of suspension. And what's important to understand so that nobody has a misinterpretation of these data is that these data are about the kinds of things that happen to girls as a function of subjective teacher judgment, like the kinds of things that Tony or and I are doing, deciding that Tony's not paying attention, deciding that maybe she's mocking Anaya. The discipline that we're talking about here has to do with teachers' readings of girls and decisions about whether those are infractions or not. And the research on this, which comes from a very good report published by Georgetown Law School, is worth reading if you haven't seen it. It's called Black Girlhood Interrupted. So a second macro picture isn't about discipline, but is about ability status. And I'm not going to dwell on this. I'm sure this is familiar to you, too. But here, what I'm focusing on is the disproportionality of assignment of black and brown children to, on one hand, gifted programs, and on the other hand, special education. So on one hand, in terms of gifted, there are data here that are extremely telling. For example, 6% of all students in the United States are assigned to gifted programs, but only 3% of black children and 10% of Asian students. And the details here are, are very telling. And this, too, has to do with teacher judgment. So although in the articles about this, you may think it's all from test scores, it's not. And the researchers make very clear that teacher judgments about who might qualify for gifted have a huge amount to do with who, who, then, is it, who then is assigned to gifted programs. And you see similar complementary issues around special education, like black students are twice as likely to be classified as having learning or emotional problems and be assigned to special ed as white children. Um, and there's a real consequences. Being assigned to programs that take you out of class reduces opportunities to learn. There's long-term effects in research about the effects of labeling students with particular labels. And there's lack of access to other kinds of programming. So when you look at the macro patterns, then you wonder, how do those things happen? The diagram I've showed you and the discretion helps to explain how in the moment-to-moment -moment dynamics of our judgments and our responses, that's how these patterns emerge. So now I want to ask the question, what, what typically fills in those discretionary spaces? If what I'm arguing is there's all this space in our work where we're making decisions and we're doing things, what's, what is the source of that? What is filling in those discretionary spaces? And I'm going to argue there are two big sources. One is teachers' experiences in a society filled with racism and oppression. It's not about our training as educators, not about anything specific that has to do with schooling, but just growing up, watching movies, watching ads, watch, watching the news, for goodness sakes. Uh, we all grow up. And this applies certainly to white people, but also to people of color. Our society is permeated with this. So our experiences shape who we are uh, as teachers and as educators. But more than that, it's also that what I'm calling normalized practices in schools institutionalize dominant white, middle class, other dominant groups, values, and habits. Um, and I guess what has to be said about both these points is that professional education, which ought to be the place where we interrupt both our personal experiences and assumptions and implicit biases, and should be teaching us practices that are not those same normalized practices, actually do the opposite. Professional education has never been effective at disrupting or intervening on the personal histories that people bring. In fact, often it's inattentive to them. And second, professional education not only doesn't intervene on them, but teaches these practices. Things like thumbs up, thumbs down get taught in professional development and teacher education. Things like grouping practices. Things like how you respond during a discussion to a child get taught. Take a practice like revoicing, for example, a very popular practice, particularly in math education. Have we stopped to ask ourselves about the taken for grantedness, about whether it's a good idea for teachers to revoice children's talk? Of course, sometimes it is. But do we have the opportunity to think about the possible harm when we all begin to revoice children's talk in classrooms? This is a nuanced point. It's not revoicing is good or revoicing is bad. It's learning to understand that in the discretion we exercise, 
we may very often be reproducing the same risks we're setting out to counter. So let me ask the really key question. What would it take to disrupt the patterns that lead to those data I showed you and the patterns through which, in the case of this story, black girls are marginalized? I could be telling a story about Latinx boys or about some other social group that's marginalized. I'm focusing on this, on the case of black girls. It's an important case. So let's go back to Anaya and Tony. What would it take for Anaya and Tony not to be at risk for being sidelined and for their classmates not to learn that they're struggling or disruptive? What would that take, given that these things are habitual? So first of all, we would have to be able to see that Anaya's explanation and Tony's question are key to the class's mathematical work, OK? Now, what does that require? That actually requires knowing some math. So interesting, right? So when you don't actually understand the math that's being taught about with enough nuance, you might very well only think that Anaya has the answer wrong. But in fact, Anaya not only uh, is able to give a very complete explanation of the way you reason on the number line, showing the intervals, clearly marking how they're equal, counting the whole, naming the fraction accurately, presenting clearly and explicitly to her classmates the number of things that she's doing productively and well that advance the work far outnumbers the one thing she doesn't yet have, which is she doesn't know the whole is from zero to one. But you have to know some math to recognize that her answer is brilliant. And there's only one thing missing there, and that is the very thing the class is learning right now is what's the whole on the number line. In area models, the one is not always the whole. That is the new mathematical point, and you have to know some math to appreciate the journey that the children are on right now and how important Anaya's answer is to that journey. And that's a mathematical point. But certainly you also have to take as axiomatic, and here I'm drawing from the work of Danny Martin and Macy Golson and others, to take as axiomatic the brilliance of black children, meaning assuming that black children are not struggling students, but are bright students, are contributing, are the people that are important in classrooms. And taking that as axiomatic means you then see Tony as Naya as likely contributing to the class work. But again, that's not like some lofty, like, oh, I just believe in the brilliance of black children. It means interpreted, choosing to interpret Tony as asking a key mathematical question that she means to ask. That is a choice, and that's what I mean by discretion. You can say all you want about having high expectations or believing in the brightness of black children, but then if in that moment you think Tony is mocking Anaya, that is a choice you're making. And there's no truth to be had here. There is no way to know for sure what Tony intended. What you, we do have is the discretion to choose to read her as serious. And the consequences for that choice are enormous for Tony and for her classmates. But the two things I've listed here to disrupt marginalization are things that are like beliefs and knowledge and vision. They're not actually action. And teaching is practice. Teaching is doing. So you also have to have something different to do. It's fine to say, oh, yeah, I see that Anaya is really contributing a lot here. I see that Tony probably is asking a good question. But then you have to have something different to say than thumbs up and thumbs down, or who can help Anaya, or Tony, you need to be listening better. You have to have something different to say because those things are coming out of a long history of habit. They're not, you didn't necessarily deliberately choose to say those things, but what else could be said that wouldn't, would be consistent with these beliefs? So I'm gonna show you one example. It's tiny, but just to help provoke us to realize that breaking habits and replacing them with new ones is the work. So watch the very end now from where Tony asks her question and what happens next. Okay, Tony, what's your question for her? <laughs> what? Go ahead, it's your turn. Why did you pick one seven? Thank you. <laughs> Let's listen to our answer now. That was a very good question. Can you show us again how you figured out that, why you decided one seven? So I'm arguing here that by using discretion to deliberately disrupt those patterns through which black girls are marginalized, there's simple things to learn to do differently. So to counter the pattern, in this case, there are probably many other things that could be done. Tony's contribution is publicly acknowledged. That's a very good question, says the teacher. And in fact, if you look at Tony's paper that she did before the discussion, she has the number one third, which could make you think she's trying to put Anaya on the spot. But consider this. Anaya's explanation is so good that it's 
fairly likely that Tony's now questioning, like, what is supposed to be the answer here? I thought it was one third, but she doesn't have too much of an explanation written down yet. Just says there's three parts. So after listening to Anaya, maybe she's thinking, wait, wait, maybe it's not one third. So how do we know? But it is the right question. Where did you get the one seventh? That's exactly where the class's work is right now, is to determine how do you decide the denominator on the number line. So the public acknowledgement of Tony not only positions her as contributing, but helps the mathematical work. So the impact is she's trusted, she's seen as contributing for both the precision of her question, which is perfect, and she also does something remarkable, which she asks Anaya a question instead of disagreeing with her not automatically something children are inclined to do without some effort to structure our classrooms that way. So let's think about what happened later, which we're not going to look at, although I'm going to show you a tiny bit more in a few minutes. 18 minutes later, Tony, along with a girl named Jenna, models at the whiteboard a complete explanation about how to reason about a fraction on the number line. And in her exit ticket, is carefully able to explain a different fraction on the number line. So Tony has made some progress in her learning from the fact that she wasn't marginalized and sidelined and neither were the subsequent speakers. Anaya also has very clearly made some headway. She identifies the whole as zero to one by writing that the answer to this exit ticket is two fifths because the whole is from zero to one and there are five equal parts. So that's different than where she was 18 minutes earlier. So the collective work of the class by the different way of treating the girls progressed in such a way that math got learned by these two. And she also felt good about her contribution. She wrote that she did well because she had planned to share her ideas in class and she did and it went well. But it's not just Tony and Anaya because it's 30 children in this classroom and the other children also developed a greater depth of understanding. On their exit tickets, 28 of them were able to explain a fraction on the number line after just a brief discussion. So the consequences for both their math of the girls and of the class were significant. But I'll also repeat, they also all saw black girls being smart. They both they saw black girls being smart. So let's return to the big question. What does it mean to say that our efforts to make change are still at incredibly high risk for reproducing patterns of racism and marginalization? And the argument I'm making really is that many taken for granted practices insidiously reproduce patterns of racism, sexism, ableism. Some of these are learned as part of the professional development we give or receive. Some of them we've absorbed from our deep immersion in schools. And we don't have enough opportunity to stand back and consider the effects of practices we take for granted. So we need to think about disruption. Awareness and disruption. How do our practices either reproduce or have the potential to dis disrupt these patterns? So I'm going to show you one more clip, a video, very short, from the same story. But for those of you who've seen Anaya and Tony before, you won't have seen this one. I want you to think about who might be at risk and what patterns, similar to the argument I've made about Anaya and Tony, what patterns are the risks related to? So this is gonna be a girl named Catherine. Catherine is an English language learner. She has a different answer. So following Anaya's 1 7th, Lakia asks Anaya a question and says she wonders where Anaya got the one. So Tony had asked, where do you get the seven? Lakia asked, where did you get the one? Because Lakia had two fourths on her paper and wondered about the numerator. Catherine has another answer. So we're gonna watch Catherine. So Catherine is like the fourth speaker. I think it's two fourths because there, there are two parts. There, there are four parts in, in total. And these two parts are, and this is like one and two. So two fourths. Okay. Questions, all you can do right now is ask questions. You can't agree or disagree. Does oh, anyone wanna yes. know? Ask her any questions about how she came up with two fourths. Actually, um, let's try maybe. I have one question here, then I have a question for the class. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to explain Catherine's reasoning. So Dante is asking a question now. Um, how did you know? I mean, yeah. How, why did you think that her answer was wrong? How did you? Why did you think it was two fourths? Uh, how did you get two fourths from one seven? Oh my. 
I thought it was two fourths because over here it has like two holes and we only want one mm -hmm. hole and there are, and there's one two and there's four parts in, in equal in one hole. So and there's kinda of like one two and these two parts are together, so it's kinda of like two fourths. Okay. Is that understand what she said? Yes. Can you explain it? She said that, um, she said that two, um, um, parts. So, she, what she did is... Okay, so I asked you to think about who might be at risk here. So, Catherine and Dante. So, what might happen next and why? The teacher might say, again, thumbs up if you agree with Catherine, thumbs down if you disagree. And this is a good example of teaching practices that are taken for granted as good, but reinforce status hierarchies. For either Anaya or Tony, for either Anaya or Catherine, if the teacher takes that move, either of those girls would be standing at the board where most of their classmates have their thumbs down. Do we think about that before we use that move? What does that mean to be Catherine at the board having most children with their thumbs down? Most children don't have two-fourths. They have other answers, but they don't have two-fourths. That's an example of what I mean by not thinking yet about what happens to the hierarchies in classrooms when we use what sounds like a good move. Another student might say to Catherine, I disagree with Catherine. You're not supposed to count the zero. Um, Maybe we think that's a good thing for a student to do, but let's think about that. The norms of classroom discourse might lead Catherine to be positioned in a way that reinforce patterns of the way EL students are perceived, that sort of overtake her answer and simply confront her. I disagree with Catherine is a different statement than I disagree with that answer. Or the teacher might say, you need to listen if you ask someone a question, Dante. And in this case, it reinforces the pattern of focusing on behavior over ideas, positions Dante in class, re reinforces patterns of perception about the way black boys are seen. Dante is a kid who's always asking a question. How the teacher chooses to position him has big consequences for both how he and his classmates understand him. So there are three kinds of patterns that we've been talking about. One has to do with discipline, one has to do with ability, and one has to do with mathematics itself. So I'd like to talk briefly about each of those and what our work is going forward. So what would it take to disrupt our patterns of racism related to discipline? So Tony is vulnerable to that. Dante is vulnerable to that. What would it take? First of all, we would have to be aware of these patterns and the ways they play out in minute-to-minute -minute classroom life. That means knowing at the macro level the data and patterns of the overpunishment of brown and black children, Understanding that they're not just contemporary, but they're the product of long cultural, historical, and societal patterns going way back, way back to the time of slavery in this country, and that there are many iterations and chapters of these. And understanding how these patterns shape white children should be learning about race. But then disrupting them means consciously not following into or fo following, following those patterns or falling into them, which might include examples like thinking hard about what, what your desires about control are. What needs to be controlled? Is it something that makes you more comfortable? Does it make us more comfortable? Is there something that needs to be controlled? Why is it that we're controlling the things we're controlling? Not calling students out for a behavior that only irritates you when it's not disturbing anybody else. Engaging students in high status specific roles sharing on solutions, calling on other kids, and publicly acknowledging mathematical competence. So doing something different is part of the resistance to the reproduction of racism. It's not just seeing these patterns, not just knowing that black boys are overpunished. It's having different moves to make with the Dantes of our lives. What about patterns of oppression related to ability? So that's where the special education and gifted and all of that comes from. Again, awareness and disruption. Being much more critically conscious of how positioning and trait ability language permeate our talk. If we had more time, I would ask you to make your top 10, a list of the top 10 words that are used to describe children. And I think what you would notice is that they're all static, trait related, and almost positional, behind, struggling, above grade level, advanced. Why are those words the way we talk about children? 
that's part of our professional lexicon, and we have to become critically conscious of what, why it is we talk about children that way, and to know they're not neutral. They're related to race, class, and gender. Knowing how these relate to the over-assignment of black and brown children to special education and under-assignment to gifted programs, and knowing that they too are part of a much longer set of histories. Again, awareness is great, but awareness doesn't by itself disrupt patterns. So what is the disruption? Again, consciously not simply falling into those patterns, not using that language, and being much more concrete. Describing what children are actually doing, like understands that naming a fraction involves the concept of equal parts rather than is struggling with fraction concepts or below grade level. Deliberately attending more to what students do know and what they can do, not just what they don't know. And choosing new kinds of mathematical tasks that make much more space to see the capabilities of students instead of ones that are so narrow that all we get to see is what kids can or can't do. So there are active things we can do besides being aware that we're part of a long set of histories and we can individually and collectively act different. And finally, what about the content itself? Mathematics. Again, we have the same set of ideas. Realizing that mathematics in our society historically has been seen as both intellectually demanding and what it means to be smart. Thinking about the legacy of what we consider it, what constitutes being smart, like being fast, the images that children and we see about who mathematicians are and the ways in which stereotypes about which social identities tend to be the people who are good at math. Those are patterns we're aware of, but how do we disrupt some of those? We need to construct mathematical work that disrupts societal ideas about what math is. We need to intervene on who and what is seen as smart by naming things in class that are mathematically valuable, that are not about being fast, that are not just about being uh, uh, quick or right, we can help to broaden what kids think math is. For example, spending time on the quality of math Anaya's explanation is one of the mathematical practices in the Common Core, constructing viable mathematical arguments. Taking the time to talk through what was it about her explanation that is what we're trying to learn to do is not only useful for everyone's learning, not only positions Anaya as contributing as a black girl, but also advances a broader view of what counts as doing well at math. If the only response is that it's not one seventh, we're reproducing a narrow view of what the point is. And finally, creating norms of discourse that are respectful and inclusive while also supporting disagreement and argument. So we saw some examples of that. I think we repeatedly saw no agreeing or disagreeing. First, you have to figure out what someone is saying. Ask them a question. I would say our society would be a lot better off if people started by figuring out what other people were saying. So this is something as far as democratic action we can take inside our classrooms. And the, the excitement over math classrooms that are more open, where there's more discussion, easily leads us down a path where disrespectful moves are made by children to one another and us to them that reproduce those same patterns and positionings. So a lot of care has to be taken as we open up classrooms for much more talk, much more disagreement, because those same kinds of patterns occur in those classrooms. And that's what I've been trying to show you today, is that through that discretion, we have to be attentive that the classroom is porous to the histories of our society, and that it takes deliberate work on our part and perhaps most complicatedly, realizing that even when we have good intentions, despite our best intentions in the title of a book that I absolutely love, despite by Amanda Lewis um, and her colleague, um, who knows the co-author of Despite Our Best Intentions. Shout it out. Yes, thank you. Um, Despite our best intentions, we are very likely to fall prey to reproducing the same patterns that permeate our society. So it is collective work to start learning to ask ourselves, does this practice that appears to be good and is being promoted, does it actually disrupt marginalization and oppression? Or am I, as a product of the society, simply falling into those same again? So I'll leave you with two thoughts from people other than, um, other than the people we've been talking about and me. One is Marcel Haddix, who is a literacy scholar at the uh, Syracuse University, and she inspires me with her idea that teaching is a revolutionary act. Uh, I think it's revolutionary because we have incredible power for good, or when we're not careful, 
for harm through the infinitely many discretionary spaces in our practice. That's where we have power and leverage, is because there's so much space. But it's also where, when we're inattentive, we, we just simply fall into the same pattern. So how can we learn to see and use those discretionary spaces? First of all, we have to become aware of the density of taken for granted normalized practices that reflect whiteness and oppression without us ever saying that or calling it out. We've got to notice how much our practice, as devoted as we may be, is based on these. And to understand that they're habits. This is not a blame game. It's not like people are intentionally doing these things. They may be. But in general, what I'm talking about is habitual action that's wired into and embedded in our thinking and our habits of work which means that we can draw on the literature about how you break habits to help ourselves learn. We have to work on breaking these habits of response to children and positioning children or thinking about math or thinking about what's good practice that are rooted in racism and oppression. But most important of all, those three won't get us anywhere unless we develop new repertoires of practice and new habits of how to learn and scrutinize those new practices carefully. And if we do that, we have a great deal of power to contribute to the disruption of injustice and to be vigilant about not falling into reproducing it. So what I think is hopeful about all of this is that teaching is incredibly powerful. And we have an opportunity to contribute enormously and significantly in the lives of the humans who are in our care as they pass through our schools and those who that they learn about one another as well as about themselves. But it's also an imperative for us. So I leave you to remember that even classrooms that are rich in rigorous mathematics and discourse are still high risk for reproducing patterns of racism and marginalization. You have a lot of power as school leaders, as coaches, and as teachers to avert and disrupt these. But without conscious effort, we will all be likely to reproduce these. My final quote is from the Reverend James Reeb, whom you may remember was the white minister who was killed two days after Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama. In one of his last sermons, he said this, and I find this to be a realistic and important thought to carry with you as you leave this conference. He said, we're going to have to take upon ourselves a disciplined and continuing effort to combat racism with no real hope that in our lifetime, we're going to be able to take a vacation from the struggle for justice. And I see the discretionary spaces argument as an opening to help us understand how in our daily work, we have multiple opportunities to not take a vacation, but to also take the small steps that will lead us toward an arc for justice. So reaching for those possibilities is our collective work, not the work of any one of us alone. Thank you.